Here we are guys. We made it to lucky lecture number 13. Today we're going to discuss evidence-based practice and how it can be used in the clinical laboratory setting. Now the concept of evidence-based practice was developed in the 1990s and soon after uh, started being applied to various healthcare fields. If you were to search for articles um, on the internet right now about evidence-based pr practice in medicine, you would get lots and lots of results for um, evidence-based pra evidence practice in nursing. There will be a few other professions sprinkled in, but you would see very few articles that discuss evidence-based practice in the clinical lab. But this is an important concept that is probably used in the lab more often than we realize, or at least some variation of this concept. So hopefully this lecture will bring to light some of the processes taking place when um, changes are made in the lab. So the objectives for this lecture, number one, define evidence-based practice, EBP, and discuss how it applies in the clinical laboratory. Number two, describe the evidence-based practice process and evidence-based decision making. Number three, identify sources of clinical evidence available to laboratory professionals. And number four, explain how an evidence-based practice approach can be used to implement change in the clinical laboratory. So here is an outline of today's lecture and what we're going to talk about uh, more specifically. So first we will define evidence-based practice. Then we'll consider the importance of EBP and what barriers um, to practice might exist. We will go over evidence, what it is and what it isn't. Next, uh, we'll walk through the evidence-based practice process and tie it in with evidence-based decision making. Following that, we will talk about how evidence-based practice can be applied in the laboratory and look at an example scenario. So here we go. Defining evidence-based practice. EBP is the integration of the best research evidence, clinical expertise, and patient needs that will result in the best patient outcomes. So these three components are really the heart of evidence-based practice and they work together to achieve the goal of best patient outcomes. The phrase evidence-based practice is really an umbrella term and it covers evidence-based medicine, evidence-based nursing, evidence-based public health, evidence-based laboratory medicine, and so on. For this lecture, we'll stick to the original phrase, evidence-based practice, and evidence-based laboratory medicine. The impact that evidence-based practice can have on patient outcomes is significant. EBP encourages critical thinking as well as the use of the most up-to-date scientific research findings as a basis for making medical decisions. There are three main advantages to using an evidence-based practice model. First, it offers an objective way to determine and maintain consistently high standards in medical care. It can also speed up the process of putting research findings into practice. And this is crucial because a study done in the year 2000 found that on average, it takes 17 years for clinical research to be implemented into practice. So by helping to make good evidence easier to find, evidence-based practice can work to lessen that delay. And the third main advantage is the potential to reduce healthcare costs and increase efficiency in the healthcare system. While evidence-based practice is very important for many reasons, there are also barriers to practice. Time constraints, lack of support from administration, little to no access to quality evidence, and lack of skills needed to evaluate research are all reasons that evidence-based practice may not be successful in certain environments. <clears throat> okay, now that we have some background on what evidence-based practice is, let's talk about the evidence part. 
What is evidence and what are some examples of reliable sources of evidence? Evidence is really data and information on the intended topic that have been collected from credible sources. Examples of credible sources include uh, peer-reviewed published research, usually published in a professional or academic journal. Also included are documents, reports, technical bulletins, or protocols produced by a government agency, so CMS, CDC, the FDA, Department of Health and Human Services. Those are all government agencies that um, may produce these types of documents. Now for laboratory professionals, Tec technical documents or package inserts, as well as vendor or manufacturer materials are sometimes useful sources. It is necessary to ensure that these documents are free of bias and opinions, especially information from vendors or manufacturers. So now let's get into the details of the evidence-based practice process. The process always begins and ends with the patient. Remember, the goal here is best patient outcomes. And this process has five steps, sometimes referred to as the five A's. Ask, acquire, appraise, apply, and assess. Now a little more detail about each step in the process. Ask is the first step, where you will formulate a focused question related to your topic. Next, you will acquire relevant data or evidence from credible sources. Then you evaluate the evidence you've collected. For this appraisal, you should consider the validity of the source, its relevance to the topic, and the study design. Once credible sources have been identified and compiled, it's time to implement a new process. And finally, after the new process has been implemented for some time, you are able to evaluate it to ensure all the benchmarks have been met. An evidence-based decision-making is an interrelated concept that essentially applies this evidence-based process to decision-making, which then results in improved healthcare quality and best patient practices. Now that we've had an overview of evidence-based practice, um, let's move on to how this can be applied in the clinical laboratory setting. Evidence-based laboratory medicine, EBLM, as defined by Christopher Price is the conscientious, judicious, and explicit use of best evidence in the use of laboratory medicine investigations for assisting in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The main objective of evidence-based lab medicine is to provide sound evidence, reasons, and rationale for changing your clinical practice or practices. Examples of clinical practices that might change include a change in test methodology, determining which results get reported, establishing accurate interpretations of results for new tests, and altering how results reports are laid out for non-laboratory providers. The main focus of evidence-based lab medicine is obviously evaluation and use of laboratory tests, and the end goal is ultimately best patient outcomes, but also better quality practices, decreased medical errors, and increased value and cost efficiency. So let's say the lab is considering changing to a new test methodology. They're working through the evidence-based uh, evidence practice process to determine if they should follow through with a new test or not. Now during the process, they need to keep some basic questions in mind. First, they should ask themselves if there's a problem with the current test methodology. And if there is, what is the problem? Is it the turnaround time? problems communicating results, it's frequently being ordered inappropriately, then the lab should question whether the new test methodology would contribute to improve patient outcomes. And the value and cost efficiency of the new test methodology should also be compared to that of the current or old test method. 
and they should question how the new testing will be implemented and how it will be evaluated. There may be more questions that come up while this lab is working through the EBP process, but as they move further along in the process, it should help them with evidence-based decision making. Now, let's see if we can apply what we've learned to a case study scenario. Here's the background. The laboratory or institution currently requires nurses to collect specimens for aerobic and anaerobic culture using two different swabs. This results in frequent requests for specimen recollection due to various errors during the collection process. So, your lab is going to choose a new collection and transport system for swabs that allows for aerobic and anaerobic culture specimens to be collected with the same swab. You decide to utilize the evidence-based laboratory medicine process to aid in the selection of the best swab. Now, let's work through the evidence-based laboratory medicine process as if we were part of this lab that is choosing a new swab collection and transport system. Step one is to ask, so we need to formulate our question. We can keep it simple, so let's go with which swab should we purchase? The next step is acquire. We need to collect data to help answer our question so we can review package inserts and technical documents from any swabs we try and we can look for any peer-reviewed journal articles. Appraise is the next step. So we need to evaluate the sources we found in step two and choose sources that are relevant to the different swabs being tested. Step four is apply. We have collected and evaluated sources and decided on a swab we want to use on a trial basis. In this step, we'll work to implement a new process using the new swab collection and transport system into the laboratory workflow. And lastly, we need to assess the new process that was implemented in step four. The workflow that incorporates the new swab collection system needs to be reviewed to determine if predefined benchmarks are being met. At this point, it can be decided if the lab wants to continue using the new swabs or keep looking for something that fits their needs better. Now to summarize. So evidence-based practice is a process that is used to methodically introduce and implement changes in different healthcare settings, and this includes the lab. So in the lab, this can be used in many instances, such as acquiring a new instrument or analyzer, changing test methodologies, introducing new testing, reducing turnaround times, and so on and so on. The overall goal of evidence-based practice is to use the best scientific evidence and clinical expertise along with the patient's needs to produce the best patient outcomes possible. So that brings us to the end of our lecture for today. As always, if you guys have any comments, uh, questions, or concerns, please give me a call. Uh, my office phone number is 501-296-1017, or you can email me at lkclark at uams.edu. Um, along with this lecture, I have posted two articles that I would like you guys to read, and then don't forget to um, also work through the module that's posted. If you guys have any questions or any trouble accessing anything, please let me know. All right, thanks.